At Balchem Animal Nutrition and Health, we strive every day to deliver results you can see in your animal's productivity and your bottom line. From a smooth transition into the milking string for your fresh cows, to a happy welcome home from your furry friend. From a strong start in your poultry flock, to consistent weight gains for your finishing hogs. We expect to earn your business and your trust with our people, our products, and our science. Our people have an intense passion for your animals and your success. You can count on us for honest, candid advice and practical solutions for your toughest challenges. As the global leader in choline production, chelation, and encapsulation technology, we take our obligation to you and to the environment seriously. Our products are backed by the most extensive and thorough research portfolio, while our business is committed to advancing environmental sustainability and animal welfare. In the end, it all comes down to results. Balchem delivers real results you can count on, results that exceed your expectations, and results that bring true value to your bottom line. Leading the charge to meet the nutritional needs of ruminants, monogastrics, and companion animals, Balchem offers a growing portfolio of nutritional products and a dedication to innovation and industry sustainability. Balchem is here to solve today and shape tomorrow. Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing for Balchem, and welcome to the first Real Science event of 2021. We're excited to continue to offer unique topics and hard-hitting discussions both here on the webinar series and during the Real Science Exchange podcast. Today's Real Science webinar, titled Maintaining a Healthy Ruminant Digestive Tract, will take a look at how the digestive system impacts all aspects of the dairy cow's productivity. I would now like to introduce Dr. Aldridge. Brian graduated from the University of Liverpool and then completed an internship in food, animal medicine, and surgery at Louisiana State University. He completed a food, animal medicine, and surgery residency and MS at Colorado State University and achieved diplomat status in the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. He earned a PhD at the University of Wisconsin for examining the transfer of colostral leukocytes to the newborn calf. Dr. Aldrich worked at the University of California, Davis, and in association with the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito studying marine mammal immunology and immunogenetics. During this time, he also worked as a large animal clinician in the veterinary teaching hospital at UC Davis. Brian joined the founding faculty of the College of Veterinary Medicine, Western University, California, as an associate professor of large animal medicine and an adjunct professor at the College of Agriculture at Cal Poly in 2003. He then returned to the UK with his family in 2005, where he held the post of Professor of Farm Animal Health and Production at the Royal Veterinary College and also worked at the University of Cambridge. Currently, Dr. Aldridge is a clinical professor in rural animal health management at the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Illinois. Brian's principal clinical interests are in farm animal medicine and the interface between health and production in growing animals. Dr. Aldridge, welcome, and the floor is now yours. Scott, thank you very much, and uh, thank you uh, for attending uh, here on Tuesday morning. It's good to see you all, and um, I enjoyed seeing Balcamp's portfolio of products. I'm talking today about a healthy ruminant digestive tract. And as Scott just mentioned, my main interest is in, in growing animals, so in, in young calves and growing livestock. And so I really want to sort of lay out the idea of health and the health foundations that occur during that growing period. Um, and actually, as we go into my slide set, you'll see a lot of them uh, aren't pictures of ruminants, there's pictures of pigs in there as well. So the principles we're going to be talking about today go beyond just ruminants. Um, they can be broadly applied across all different species. So I hope uh, for those of you who are looking at different species, that's uh, of help to you as well. So we're going to be talking about just not just maintaining it, but sort of developing a healthy digestive tract as well. 
as we do this, I'm going to sort of give you a little bit of a new perspective. I want you to see things a little bit differently, particularly as it ref with respect to health and to, dis to disease, because we have some very sort of fixed definitions. When we think of disease, we think of an individual catching something and that we need to diagnose that particular disease. And in, in the clinical realm, we often think about names of diseases. And actually, sometimes clinicians get a little bit stuck if they can't name the disease. The idea is I need to name it before I can treat it or before I can prevent it. And very often those names are linked to the bugs that cause them. So we're very pathogen centric. I want us to think a little bit differently and to think about the host. So to adopt a sort of a host centric approach, again, whichever host you're talking about, cows or pigs or poultry, it's the same. I want you to understand that our animals are complex systems living within complex systems. So they're made up of different um, organ systems and different, um, um, different organs that are all interrelated. And those organs, are made up themselves of, of different tissues. There's different tissues kind of working within these organs. And those tissues are made up of different molecules. And all of these things are kind of interacting. And so what we do when we're sort of looking at health is we, we, we deconstruct that and try and understand the hierarchy of what's taking place. So what's, what's the primary factors? What's the primary body systems that are affected? Because when, we, when something goes wrong in, with health, it's not just one part of the system. Uh, it's usually, um, as we have challenges to this whole system, the whole the system breaks. Even though the challenge might be in one particular area, it's going to affect the whole system. So we need to adopt a sort of a systems-based uh, approach. I work in a medical school here that's kind of linked to the engineering school. It's really helped me understand that those kind of concepts of, of systems within the body, but also um, systems at the farm level. So I want you to think about to optimize animal health, welfare and performance, we've got to understand the structure, function and independence of these complex systems that we're in. Now, are you ever going to be in a perfect system? Is it ever going to be completely calm? No, we know that's not true. We know every system we work in, whether you're a producer, a clinician, animal health professional, you know that it's going to be pretty, it can get pretty rocky, can get pretty stormy out there. It's either ripples or big waves. So we have to design our system. We have to design our system in the face of challenges. We're not designing it around a perfect system. And I want to introduce this, introduce this concept to you of, of what we call the resistant phenotype. And again, a slightly different view, a slightly different view on health and disease. Thinking about the host, how do we help the animal be healthy? And when we think about this, not just thinking of health as binary, as animals as healthy, or as disease, that's not really how it works. Health is a continuum and disease is a continuum. So we have animals um, with a normal healthy state and here when they're in this healthy state, they're actually fairly stable, resilient to perturbations or disruptions. But what we don't recognize very often, there's a lot of animals in our populations that are in what we call a pre-disease state and this is unstable and a good time to get involved and, and uh, then you can push them back into the healthy state. What we don't want is animals going into the disease state because that is also a very stable state and it's hard once they're in the disease state to get them back into the pre-disease state. So don't just think of health and disease, think of this whole continuum. And in any one particular population, you're gonna see animals along that whole uh, spectrum, that whole continuum of disease. And animals moving between, it doesn't happen suddenly. Sometimes we do, sometimes we might get an infectious agent come in and we get a sudden change, but usually in a system, it's a, it's, it's a series of steps, minor changes that are affecting that. So when you think of disease as a failure to maintain homeostasis, not just something you catch, but a failure to maintain homeostasis. And thinking about homeostasis as this balance, the animal in balance with its ecosystem. All of these systems, all of these organs, uh, the animal itself, uh, um, existing in a health phenotype, but a dynamic health phenotype, a phenotype that can be affected. We, we're used to phenotype as shape and size, but this is a health phenotype. And what do we want our animals to be in? We want our animals to be in a, res a resistant phenotype. Um, 
Now, people in, in horticulture, people in, in agronomy and crops, they understand this idea of a diseased and a healthy phenotype. We haven't sort of talked about it so much. We think about many phenotype affecting production, but the phenotype is in our hands. The health phenotype is in our hands. So it's up to us to maintain it. Understanding that not every animal is the same. Every animal in your population has a different phenotype and it changes. So an animal over time and in different environmental conditions, different systems moves between the health and disease state. So in this figure here, we see healthy animals, we see diseased animals, and this important category I want you to think about, pre-diseased animals. And here's what's happening in time. So one animal doesn't change in that same state. It can move, it can increase in health, or it can, it can decrease in, in health, particularly when you get particular challenges. And I don't just mean weather by this, but particular challenges to the system, challenges to the ecosystem. So as, as it faces a challenge, a, a healthy animal might move into the pre-diseased state. Uh, a pre-diseased animal might move into the disease state. As those things get better, as the animal is, is cared for, it can move from the diseased into the pre-diseased and hopefully back into the healthy state. So in different seasons, we see different numbers of animals in these different states. So that's an important thing to understand and to work out how to measure that and to gauge that in your particular animals. And you know all the different sort of challenges in the systems that actually cause that poor ventilation, weaning, anxiety. So not every animal, not every individual has the same health phenotype. <clears throat> they might look the same, they might look the same outwardly, but actually what's taking place physiologically and what's taking place anatomically. So we know this when we talk to, to particularly about infections, right? I say we're not just talking about pathogens, but we know that within any population that's suffering infection, we know this with COVID, right? We have a certain number of people that individuals are infected, a certain number that are resistant and some that are susceptible. And during um, a health event or a health challenge event, these numbers are going to change. Part of our job is, <clears throat> excuse me, working out how many are in any particular group. And by doing that, we know what our intervention needs to be to move the animals into this resistant phenotype, get them away uh, from susceptible into this kind of resistant phenotype. So individual animals exhibit a dynamic phenotype. We want them to have a resistant phenotype. And what we do managementally affects that. Again, we're used to phenotype being shape and size and and, and a description of that. So, so we understand this concept of phenotype, but we don't always understand what it means for health. We might understand that between Bos indicus and Bos, um, Bos taurus, right? We might have animals that are resistant to parasites or to um, temperature. We might have them, uh, ones that are particularly good at growing uh, fleece or growing hair or growing meat. So we, we know that this kind of phenotype is affected. People are looking at welfare phenotype, wellness. And we know how phenotypes determine, right? We think about the genetics and we've worked hard at breeding, at getting animals, at working out. But we forget sometimes that what we do managementally, the environment interfaces with genetics. It's G times E is what determines phenotype. So what we do, what we're feeding them, how we handle them, uh, the environment, the comfort that we give them, all of that determines ultimately their phenotype, their health phenotype. And that changes over time. So phenotype is G times E times T. So bearing that in mind, that's what we're affecting. And that's the same for health of phenotype as well. Now, a lot of this I said earlier is determined really early on in life. So we know that with plants, right? This is kind of the concept of epigenetics. We've done our breeding work. We know uh, what our genotype is. But then afterwards, so an animal has all of these different um, genes, has a mosaic, some from mom, some from dad. That's going to determine my genetic makeup and particularly those that determine health, intestinal health, epithelial integrity, my immune system. But then there's all of these different factors, management factors, um, therapeutic factors that come in and alter which genes are switched on and which genes are switched off. So ultimately, what the phenotype is that that mass of gene expression tells me what phenotype it is. So we're interested in the resistant phenotype, a robust animal that's responsive. To kind of illustrate what that means when, it, when we think about resistant, think about a mountain or like a big skyscraper up in Chicago. Some architects design it so that it's really solid. 
doesn't move at all when the wind comes. So that's kind of a robust phenotype, right? Whatever thrown at it, um, it doesn't move. Some people design skyscrapers that they move. The wind comes in and actually it moves, but doesn't fall down. Now that's homeostasis. So here we have robust and responsive, robust and homeostatic. So that combination is what we're looking for our animals. They resist challenges, but also when a challenge comes, which they're going to, they're able to respond and adapt. That's true in the uh, gastrointestinal tract. That's true in the respiratory tract as well. So individual animals exhibited this dynamic health phenotype. And what we do managementally affects that health phenotype. We thought about storms, but think about a desert. What determines how this one plant can sort of can, can survive out there? It just doesn't. It's not just robust, it's actually adapting as well. So a resistant phenotype is one that can respond or change when it faces challenge as well. So now we've got to go back and sort of think about this system. If this system's going to have to be able to respond, it's got to have some sensors. And this is kind of a generic model of a, of, a, of a system. There's a sensor, the data from what's sensing is this system's always being monitored. And that information is being taken to a processor and that processor is, is gauging it against normal and saying, OK, what's normal? Um, is, how far out of whack is this taking place? This is occurring in the animal all the time. This is occurring in the intestinal tract, the respiratory tract, always being monitored, compared against normal. And the animal is making adaptations uh, in response to that. But so any system, the farm itself, the individual, that's what's taking place. Sensing changes in the system, communicating it, processing it distributing it out to a controller, which actually um, invokes uh, responses which are gonna correct any abnormality as well. That's gotta happen in every organ system. It's gotta happen in the heart. It's gotta happen in the intestine. It's gotta happen in the respiratory tract. And also getting some feedback from those effector mechanisms that, sh that make fine, fine tuning. And that's where our immune system comes in. And particularly when we think about our, our Places like the intestine or the respiratory tract, we have several immune, we have several mucosal surfaces. And we're really interested in, in, in that with health because that's where the animal engages the environment. So I'm not going to think about the immune system as, as, as a warrior, not just, not just a set of soldiers. Right? And that's a traditional way of thinking about it. I like to think about the immune system more as like a group of city workers. The city workers that's looking after this body. In fact, uh, a peacekeeping force, right? Not just fighting bad guys, but knowing what's going on in the community. I want you to think about the immune system as primarily an organ of homeostasis. We're taking care of health. We have to take care of the homeostasis. And the immune system itself works as a system. It fits into that, that model that we just said. It's got different components. Right? We have to understand each of those components and how they work together. If we are uh, coming in with management, we need to sort of break down, understand the different components of that uh, immune system. That's kind of reductionism. Know which ones are important. What am I affecting by nutrition? What am I affecting by uh, environmental modulation? What am I affecting by um, particular vitamins or minerals? And I want to make sure when I'm doing that, that I'm collecting information about that, not just about the health of my body system, but how's my immune system doing? Because if I can't do that, I don't know how to fix it. So my system again, here's the system. I'm, I'm going to use this as we're going to sort of unravel, help you understand how health is maintained in the intestinal tract. Um, the immune system has to monitor the whole body. Right, so it's got to have some sensors. It's got to signal. It's got to tell. Um, it's got to tell the rest of the body what's taking place, so that changes can happen. It's got to process, compare abnormal to normal, what's taking place and what should be taking place. It's got to evoke different um, responsive mechanisms to restore health. And here's the idea: the immune system isn't just fighting pathogens. The immune system is maintaining normality. So to help you understand this, without getting into tons of, of, of technical details, I know you had a really good uh, immunology talk uh, a couple of months ago, but I want you to think about an animal as a city, and each of the organs is kind of um, being, being having a sort of a different neighborhood of the city. 
And here, I want you to think about different streets and the streets of the intestinal tract or the respiratory tract, so the mucosal surface. And the lining, the buildings that line those streets are the, um, um, are the cells. And the immune system is a bit like Venice. Think about it as Venice, right? It's traveling uh, around in different um, um, canals to take care of this system. But the immune system isn't just sort of looking for bad guys, right? It's not just sort of looking for pathogens. Though there is co this constant movement that's taking place, the immune system has to take care and, and, and scan everywhere, doesn't it? But also, we're going to make this city an adobe city. So because our mucosal surfaces are so determined, uh, so affected by hydration, I want you to have the idea that it can dry out as well. So it's kind of a mud city. So let's go down. I just want to sort of say, so think about what's happening. What's happening at the street level um, and these canals, right? The canals are where all of the nutrients, right, are being spread around the body. But those nutrients come in via the roadways, right? So the intestine where we're meeting bugs is actually where our food comes in. The respiratory tract where we're meeting bugs is actually where our oxygen comes in and then is distributed via the canal system. So these, our streets are really important, not just for the microbes, but also for our nutrients. So let's have a think. Let's think particularly again about our mucosal surfaces. The intestine and the respiratory tract is where our host is most closely connected to its environment. So we think about these kind of buildings. Let's sort of think. So it needs to be the biggest uh, defense force at these mucosal sites. So when we think of immunity, don't think of the bloodstream. Think about what's taking place at the mucosal site. So we have the epithelium, which are these buildings, and the epithelium's covered with uh, mucus and with this really rich population that we're understanding uh, called the microbiome. And then it's supplied by um, different immune cells. So we have physical barriers, innate barriers, and adaptive barriers. So the immune system isn't just these cells, though these cells are part of it, and they're always communicating. They're saying, what's going on? Um, what do I need to do to change uh, uh, what's happening? Uh, what do I do? I need to detect abnormalities. I need to detect what's taking place in my lumen. I want to know what bugs are there. But also the immune system has to scan for any damage. I want to make sure that the microbiome's healthy. I want to make sure there's no holes or breaks in the epithelium. So the immune system isn't just dealing with pathogens. It's monitoring the health of those mucosal surfaces. So we have a physical component, a barrier, we have this innate, we have a mucus system, we have a microbiome that's protective as well. And that's, that's kind of uh, an area in which we, we really understand uh, quite well. Understanding what's taking place now with the mucus, how the microbiome is, is uh, interfacing uh, with that mucosal surface as well. And when we think of the microbiome, I think when we talk to our producers and for ourselves, it's really important to think about this as a garden. This isn't just a bunch of bugs. When people think of microbes, they don't like that. We want to maintain this microbiome as a rich ecosystem. So think about it as looking after a garden. So we want our farmers to look at the lining of our intestinal tracts as they would care for their, their crops or for their garden. So when we think again, so we have this sort of triad that's, that's we have at mucosal surfaces. We have the epithelium, we have the immune system, a lot of immune cells that are there, and we have the microbiome. So it's this triad, and this is the respiratory tract and the intestinal tract. And what we're doing managementally, we have to look after all three of those particular elements. Because what they do, they, they talk to one another. There's this continual crosstalk between the epithelium, the immune system, and the microbiome. They don't live independently. And in any system, communication, as I said, is really important. So what we're going to make sure is that we don't mess up this communication. And in fact, so when there's damage in one area, so in the respiratory tract, let's say as you're going outside in the winter, if you live in a cold area like I do, if you get damaged to the epithelium, that messes up the microbiome and can give you inflammation. In the absence of a pathogen, physical damage can, can invoke and change what's taking place. So this microbiome is responding to what's happening in the epithelium. It's responding what's happening in the immune system and vice versa. And the immune system, and the microbiome we know contains lots of microbes. Some are, some are commensals, some kind of live there. We don't always know what their function are. We have these symbiotes and they, have, they are beneficial. A lot of those are luminal. They contribute to digestion, for instance. So we're interested in that group. Um, they produce local antimicrobial factors. And amidst that group, 
are also pathobiots as well. So the microbiome is lots of good stuff, and there are some micro, some pathogens that are normally there. It's only when they get out of control that we get a, a disease process. So if we go back into our Adobe City and we look in the streets, we're going to see normal microbes uh, throughout the whole lining of our, our intestinal tract. But hidden there, there are some bad guys. So I'm not saying, I'm not undermining the reality of pathogens, but the pathogens. So we, we can do cultures and find pathogens there. They're not always there causing disease. Those pathogens only become dangerous when something else takes place and gives them an advantage. So perhaps XI comes and damages the intestine um, or allows that microbe to, uh, to itself um, get, gain some advantage in that local area. So the pathogens don't normally by themselves just flare up. They need another factor to disrupt their ecosystem, and then they can become mischief makers. Now, this is a challenge for the immune system, right? Because what the immune system does, it scans the whole of the microbial population, the bacteria, the, um, the viruses, and it's got to work out which are the bad guys and which are the good guys. So we've got to maintain our immune system, our, the sensing part of our immune system in a healthy state, so it can actually do its job of working out, hey, what's good and what's bad? There's lots of good microbes there. We don't want to damage that. But we also want the immune system to detect when a, a, micro, a, a group of mischief make, make, makers takes hold. Maybe that occurs when we give a certain antibiotic, we, we give certain an oral component, we change what's taking on GI. So we're really important, we're really interested in this, in the immune system as a sort of a scanning system, how it fits into this idea of a system. There are sensor cells. There are regulator and processing cells and controller cells, and there are effector cells. So it, it fits into our idea. The immune system is always sensing, always scanning the GI tract for any damage, any harm. Luminally, sc scanning the lumen, scanning the lining, scanning what's taking place beyond the lining as well. Scanning the microbiome, scanning the immune, um, scanning the epithelium. And it's communicating through cytokines, through chemokines, through chemical mediators. And it has to be processed and regulated. And very often, um, what we find is that microbes and our management factors mess up one part of this system. Not all parts mess up, might mess up sensing, might mess up communication, might mess up control or regulation, might mess up the effectors. Different nutrients, for instance, contribute to different parts of that whole system, not the whole system. So we have to understand these different components and what we're doing managementally to affect that. Now, I think the most important part of the immune system is inflammation, it's the key. The adaptive immune system is important and we spend a lot of time with vaccines, that's all good, but we've got to get inflammation right. This is the first response to any damage, not just pathogens, any damage, chemical damage, mechanical damage. And inflammation has six key steps. I want to just, um, people don't often talk about inflammation, they talk a lot about T cells and B cells, but inflammation is really important. So here are the steps. One is recognition, the, the idea of recognition. So recognition is, is this idea of sensing. The immune system always scanning and knowing what's taking place. So scanning uh, the lumen and the, the lining, the mucosa for pathogens through pathogen associated molecular patterns, and also for damage through damage associated molecular patterns. Particular damage, particular pathogens release different molecules. Um, the second one is neutralization. So if there is, if they detect any damage, a lot of the initial response isn't systemic, it's very local. So you want a right set of, um, you want the right sensing, you know what's going on, is it damage, is it a pathogen, what do I have to deal, uh, how do I deal with it? And then these local cells, the epithelium amongst them can actually release factors. They can release factors and what they're aiming at doing is they're aiming at trying to neutralize that damage, so localize it to make sure it doesn't uh, go too far. Uh, and if they can, they want to repair it. So they either damage it by restricting it, they might use chemicals that they produce, or um, they might get uh, different chemicals such as antimicrobial peptides from the bloodstream. So they have a whole set of resources to actually have a local response. And guess what? Probably 99% of uh, damage and infection is dealt with in this way. 
So local immune factors being produced or uh, factors from the bloodstream being uh, filtered and concentrated there and doing the whole process of healing locally. And you might never see a systemic change in the animal. But this is an animal, right? In a pre-disease state. <coughs> We haven't seen overt disease, but we've seen damage and the inflammatory system has dealt with that. The second one, if that doesn't work, is amplification. Each of these are a different step. So what if, what if the local mechanisms, the local cells um, can't deal with it themselves? Uh, they try and trap them, they try and neutralize them, they try and localize it, but can't do it. Then the immune system is really clever at communicating and upregulating its response in a controlled way might bring in other local immune cells, uh, other macrophages uh, that come in, um, epithelial cells might upregulate uh, what the epithelium, um, the, the sensors might upregulate the epithelium to produce local factors as well, or that response might go further afield. I might need to bring in cells from, um, from the lymph nodes. I might not even you need to start producing more in the bone marrow. So, so these local responses can become systemic. Now we're starting to see maybe some, some animals getting sick and we'll see some fever, but it's still regulated. I only want an immune response at that site. So there are these pathways to sort of say, hey, here's the disease, it's in the um, jejunum, it's in the ileum, make sure inflammation is here and nowhere else. So that regulation is, is a really important process. And actually a lot of disease is caused by dysregulation of these processes, of this control, of this detection. Um, so, so the other one is, is killing and healing and um, killing clearance and healing. So I want to kind of think about those all together. So this is the idea now that a different set of cells come in. So the neutralization hasn't happened. Um, the microbes are growing. We need to kill. We need to kill. And this is the, the classic uh, immune response. Um, this could be neutrophils that are producing local chemicals, it could be B cells that produce antibodies, it could be a cytotoxic cell. So now we're bringing in some of the big guns, right? And we need uh, more killing. But again, this is an amplification step, right? This is the next step, the inflammation. It doesn't happen right at the beginning. It only happens in those um, um, uh, problems. And, and usually what happens as a result of it is we have damage left over. And guess who clears that up? The immune system. If the immune system isn't working fully, it's not going to clear up that debris. A lot of our chronic disease, a lot of our um, pneumonias, for instance, a lot of our chronic uh, infections are because the damage is still there. The immune system hasn't been fortified so it can come in and do all of the clearance. So the immune system clears debris. It doesn't just fight pathogens and kill them. It clears the debris. And guess what? The immune system also not only does the cleaning, it also does the healing itself. So it's really important to think about um, which different cells, and there's different cell types doing this. Uh, these cleaners are neutrophils and macrophages. We need them working well, and they take a lot of energy and they take a different set of nutrients than uh, uh, lymphocytes would. Um, but also the healing and rebuilding, so the fibroblasts and, um, and the coordination of good healing uh, is also done by, guess what, the immune system. So that's why the immune system is a homeostatic system, not just a pathogen defense system. And vaccine isn't what we're, just what we're doing. So let's just go through those again. So we kind of, we think about, we think about these fibroblasts, but it's so important, this inflammation. So understanding these six sets, there's recognition that takes place. The immune system recognizes pathogens, but recognizes damage as well. Damage caused by chemical damage or physical damage. It neutralizes, the immune system neutralizes that damage or neutralizes those pathogens locally. And that's how 99% of, uh, of um, problems are dealt with. If it doesn't, if that doesn't work, it needs to be amplified. So the immune system through different communication systems amplifies its own uh, response in a regulated way. If it amplifies too much, uh, we can get more damage. And we might need to bring in some of the big guns, right? If that amplification um, um, can either occur locally, we not, might need to bring some of the uh, big cells in, neutrophils. And again, because they're the big cells, they can cause more damage, right? And so often there's a lot of debris left and that debris needs to be cleared up. The immune system does that as well. And the end response is healing. Recognition, neutralization, amplification, killing, clearance, and healing. We have to understand that process and how our care for those animals helps that. 
So the end result of a successful immune response is actually healing, restoration of normality. And that's really, that fits again, that fits our system idea, doesn't it? That fits our system idea. We have cells that are sensors. They're sensing damage. We have cells and, you know, and, and they have to sort of work out exactly what's going on. They're not just sensing general damage. They're saying, oh, this is a hole or this is a pathogen. And so that kind of, that sort of local response is kind of, regulation is kind of really important. So getting, getting the senses right and make, maintaining those senses is important. And it being able to weigh out how bad is this damage? Is this, is this a pathogen or is this a microbe? I'm, just, I'm not just having an immune response to every microbe. So that sensing is really important. Um, and then if it doesn't, this production of these um, local antimicrobial peptides kind of uh, becomes really important. If that sensing, that sensing doesn't work, then we've got to have a communication that something more is taking place. So these are the chemical mediators, the cytokines um, and the, the chemokines. And certain pathogens interfere with this signaling process. They're very clever. So they mess up the signaling around the body. Some of this is, is neural signaling as well. So the intact nerves of the uh, intestinal tract is important as well. That regulation and control takes place locally. So there are immune cells like macrophages or dendritic cells that are regulators, but it also takes place in the lymph nodes, right? So there's, there's certain um, um, regulation and control that takes place regionally, but there's also a central control process as well up in the brain and the hypothalamus. So we see this connection between the brain and the central nervous system and the mucosal immune system as well. Now, we're not going to forget the adaptive immune system because that brings to our uh, immune response specificity. It's great, right? We, we, we do want lymphocytes and antibodies. With the adaptive immune system that we vaccinate uh, to enhance brings memory. And also, some people say it's faster. I actually think inflammation is faster than a lot of our uh, adaptive immune response. So we're not undermining the importance of the adaptive immune response. But this, this resistant phenotype to deal with most things is located in the uh, inflammatory response and is determined very early on. The trajectory of our phenotype is determined really on. The foundations of immune homeostasis is developed early on in an animal's life. And it doesn't just stop there, it's a journey, right? So, that, so what we're doing uh, in feeding them, what we're doing in caring them as young animals and growing is to try and give them this kind of really robust uh, phenotype, but that can be adapted. And we're really, and here are the, and, and the big stresses take place often at this mucosal surface. So again, how we're impacting the environment is determining which genes are switched on and which genes are switched on. So we have to think of the stressors. Stressors, ab abnormalities in the environment are actually uh, changing the phenotype by their impact at that local environment. So what are we doing nutritionally that changes the microbiome? What are we doing nutritionally that invokes uh, a local inflammatory response, which would be unhealthy? What are we doing um, nutritionally uh, or managementally that's affecting the epithelium as well? And not just, at the, um, not just at the GI tract, but also in the respiratory tract and also in the uh, reproductive tract. All three of these mucosal systems are interacting with each other as well. We're finding that the GI microbiome is, is affecting respiratory health as well. So the environmental conditions at the respiratory epithelium is probably affecting the GI tract. And, and so lots of people spend time working on the environment and the humidity and the particles and the pathogen. And what they're doing is trying to work out, they're trying to maintain homeostasis and not put animals into this pre-disease state. So sometimes, again, we think about our environmental practices are, uh, are just stopping disease. It's stopping this pre-disease state as well. Similarly, the gastrointestinal epithelium too. Again, that's, we meet all of the microbes and the whole environment at the GI tract. What, what's taking place at that epithelium isn't just put in, is influencing homeostasis, not just the presence of disease, but putting animals into this pre-disease state. And we know that one of those big challenges is at weaning, isn't it? So a lot of those, a lot of the, the changes and the challenges to the epithelium uh, occur right around uh, uh, the weaning. So getting that right, we know in the GI tract is so important. And what's happening? It's homeostasis that we're disturbing uh, at that weaning point as well. So 
thinking a little bit differently about the immune system, thinking about what kind of factors actually impact the immune system, uh, which can be leading, leading us, uh, the GI tract could be leading to a pre-disease state and then uh, leading them into a, um, a disease state but also thinking how these three different organ systems, or mucosal sites, reproductive tract, GI tract, and respiratory tract are interacting. So we can't just think, we can't just think, oh, I've taken care of the GI tract, I'll forget the respiratory tract. Oh, it doesn't matter about the repro tract. Uh, so all of our animals, whatever stage of their production cycle, whether they're in estrus, whether, whether they're females in estrus, whether they're pregnant, they need different needs, different needs respiratory, different needs GI, different needs reproductive because these mucosal sites are talking to one another as well. That's going to become, a, I think that's going to become a growing concept in looking at uh, mucosal health. So we care about the epithelium, we care about the microbiome, we care about the immune system. And we think about there's two microbiomes, there's three factors in the epithelium and five factors uh, in the uh, that, that make up this adaptive immune system as well that we kind of uh, think about as well. So we talked about the city. It's, it's good to just think about what does that look like kind of at the mucosa. So the epithelium um, plays an important role as a physical barrier, doesn't it? So the epithelial cells themselves, they've got tight junctions between them. So what we're doing managementally is affecting how well those tight junctions work. What we're doing managementally is affecting the mucus layer as well. Dehydration, Water loss is one of the biggest causes of disruption of the mucus layer and one of the biggest causes probably of, of poor mucosal health. There's lymphocytes in, uh, in the epithelium called intraepithelial lymphocytes. There's lymphocytes that are in aggregates uh, called payers patches. And what they're doing is they're sampling what's taking place in the lumen the whole time. And they are giving information to the regional lymph node. So we have, we have the kind of these, these local responses. We have these immune cells um, below the surface, between the epithelium. Uh, and amazingly, these immune cells reach through the epithelium. They sample microbes. They carry them to the local lymph nodes. That's where our adaptive immune system gets processed, so B cells and T cells. And those lymphocytes then get returned by the bloodstream uh, back uh, to the local area. If I, I can vaccinate at the respiratory tract and get a response in the GI tract. I can, res I can vaccinate in the reproductive tract and get a response in the GI tract. So, so that that trafficking is, uh, isn't just for one particular mucosal system, it connects the, the immune systems as well. So when we think about stress, we, we tell the students stress is spelled C-H-A-N-G-E, it's change. And the big areas of change are at muco the mucosal level, at a mental level, neuroendocrine level, or at a metabolic level. So these are the stressors good for good or for bad that are affecting the phenotype mucosal uh, mental or neuroendocrine and metabolic so if you think about our management in those big areas now of course there's one there's another m called microbes right so certainly we want to reduce the exposure to microbes but we're looking after the mucosa we're looking after the mental state the neuroendocrine state of the animal and we're looking after the metabolic state all of these are, are coming together to form the, the resistant phenotype or the susceptible phenotype of that particular animal. And all the time they're, they're being, with, with, it's important to sort of look for measures of those things. Particular stresses um, come in and interfere with those different avenues in different ways, right? So a heat stress would damage the mucosa, dry out the mucosa respiratory wise or affect the GI mucosa by dehydration, uh, it will cause discomfort and fear. So an animal will get mental stress. It will change its metabolic needs as well. So some external stretches can uh, mess things up. So they need, all of these things need to be kind of tightly coordinated. The immune responses need very tight regulation. So pathogens come in, they're pro-inflammatory, right? So they put the animal into an inflammatory state. That's, that's, if that doesn't, if that doesn't, that needs to be regulated. Stress, all of those stresses are pro-inflammatory. But primarily, what we love to think metabolism, the GI tract is the guiding force in immunity. So for those of you who are nutritionists, you play a really important role in this because metabolism guides it. And so what, what we have is, you know, we think about, um, we think about through the bloodstream, we think about um, these different immune cells 
having to do different functions, sensors, repairers, cl cleaners, they need different composition, different sets of different nutritional needs. The different cell types need different uh, components uh, of uh, metabolism. And there's this interaction taking place all the time. So what we feed them is actually affecting uh, the uh, immune status, but immune status is also affecting the metabolic needs. So you kind of have this sort of two-way interaction taking place. And plus, we have this systemic effect as well. So the, Im the immune response is, is having a systemic effect, changing appetite, but also what's happening systemically, neuroendocrinologically, is affecting local immune cells as well. So the, the overall thing is that dis a dysmetabolism is pro-inflammatory. An immune dysregulation is a wellspring of pathology. If we get, if the immune system is dysregulated, um, we have a whole set of pathology. They found this in kids, kids with early life adversity. They found that kids, kids that get raised in difficult environment, they're in a pro-inflammatory state. All the, their immune system is kind of all switched on. It's programmed wrongly, so they're susceptible for the rest of their life to problems. And I like to think about it uh, this when we're talking about producers. This is kind of how we think about it. Then we think about um, a population. Think about a population on a slope. So think about this as a population of, of calves or cattle, and that the slope is reflects their susceptibility or resistance to disease. So at the moment, this rock is stable, and let's, let's say an infectious disease. Where it sits, right? So it's exposed to different infections. Um, the level of the slope might be how how high the uh, exposure is. And if it's a square rock, it's pretty stable. If it's a round rock, it's gonna roll down and become more and more susceptible. So this again shows this idea of, there's a range of susceptibilities, a range of, uh, of, uh, of statuses. And we want, we want our animals, our populations to be robust. So if microbes come in, they resist them really well. But what happens if the corners get rubbed off? What makes that square rock into a round rock? What makes it, likely that it's going to roll down even part way because we can do things managementally that just knock it down rounds its edges off and makes it more susceptible as it's further down now we can do if we have multiple stresses or multiple disturbances that the immune system can't respond to then uh, they might go hidden for a while and you might say oh look at the herd's fine it's because it's but it's hanging there just by one corner and what's going to happen it's okay until that final corner gets knocked off. So this is the idea that there's this stepwise decline from um, disease and from health into pre-disease into disease. And sometimes we just see, let's say we see this final stress or we see cold stress and that knocks the animal down. And we say, oh, it was because of cold stress. But really what was happening is all of the corners were being knocked off that rock before. So what we want, we want an animal or a population, not just a, a population which is made up of animals, that's square and robust. Now, there's different systems, right? There's different systems. That slope of that's determined by the infectious load. We have some places where the hygiene is poor, where they're not vaccinated, where their stocking densities are too high, um, or the, you know, long residential times. And that means, hey, they're much more likely, even the square rock is going to uh, uh, topple over at some time because my infection control isn't very good. So you have to sort of adapt that depending on the different system that you're working in. But we want to make sure that whatever the system is, we have a square rock that's designed for the level of slope at which that animal is facing and that population is facing. So it's good to think about, do you know the factors that are sort of determining uh, your, the susceptibility in your particular population? And what can you do to actually manage mentally to help your whole population be more resilient, more robust, but also be able to adapt to changes in a lot, uh, a lot healthier way. So we're thinking about how many of our animals are infected, how many are, are susceptible, how many are resistant. So what we're really interested in is by our management is taking the susceptible animals and making them into this kind of resistant phenotype. And I think about this, when I think about the immune system, I kind of think about a furnace, right? I sort of think about uh, a furnace is quite a great system. The furnace is receiving all of these inputs. If we think about the immune system as your furnace, right? So the immune system is working well homeostatically. 
it's getting input, um, maybe simply it's just getting input from temperature, a more complex system, more complex thermostat might get humidity, might know what's going on outside in the environment, might get some air quality things. So it needs processing and controlling. This is what the immune system, right? The immune system is receiving all of this knowledge and um, the, the, the healthier the immune system is, the better it can regulate and control and process this knowledge. And if the furnace is working well, it goes okay. But when it gets dysregulated, like in, in times of dysmetabolism, then it's the immune system that often causes damage. Most of the disease that we see is actually caused by the immune system, not necessarily by pathogens. So we see inflammatory processes in the intestine, inflammatory processes um, in the lungs as well. So our animals aren't perfect. Our systems are not perfect. We're often dealt with... Uh, have normal systems, but we're taking care of homeostasis. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aldrich. I, I really appreciate uh, what you've done with uh, with the animation, taking a, uh, a very complicated subject and, and attempting to make it, uh, I say attempting, I'm, I'm maybe slower than most folks. I'm, I'm gonna have to watch this uh, four or five times more just to kind of to, to allow it to uh, sink in. Uh, Related to that, we typically put our PowerPoints, make our PowerPoints available to the audience. Um, I think you can understand how, how this this uh, format doesn't lend itself to being able to do that. But what I would, would like to do is remind our audience that um, we will have the, the, the video up and available within 48 hours after this. So with that, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Aldrich. But before we get started answering questions, I'd like to share a brief video. And then we'll be right back to answer questions submitted during today's presentation. With today's low milk prices and rising feed protein costs, now is the time to turn up the dial on rumen efficiency. NitroSure Precision Release Nitrogen is designed to help stabilize rumen ammonia pools, by synchronizing carbohydrate and nitrogen availability to the microflora. Providing a consistent supply of ammonia is proven to increase rumen microbial populations, improve fiber and dry matter digestibility, and stimulate microbial protein yield, all leading to greater efficiencies in forage utilization and higher milk and milk component production. Maximize rumen microflora with NitroSure to turn up rumen efficiency and productivity. Dr. Aldridge, you uh, spoke extensively about the gastrointestinal uh, microbiome. What are the biggest external influences on the microbiome in the growing ruminant? Yes, yeah, Scott, I think that's a good question. And uh, the idea with the animations was to show how dynamic this process is as well, right? So sometimes you can't reflect it in stills and the microbiome is this really dynamic, um, um, growing ecosystem. As I said, I, I like this idea of it being a garden. What's important to recognize, I think, Scott, is that there's two, two big microbiome populations and the mucus layer of our intestine um, uh, really helps us understand that uh, to some degree, because it, uh, in, in those parts where it's of a lot of mucus, the microbiome is sort of trapped in some way. So there's a, there's a population that's right on the surface of the intestine. And then, and, that, and then there's a population that's in the lumen of the intestine. And that's true in the, in the respiratory uh, tract as well and the reproductive tract, but think about the GI tract. And the mucus layer sort of acts as um, an intermediary between those two things. So when we sample the mucosa, the, the mucus, we can get we can know what's going on in the lumen and we can know what's going on in the mucosa. But if we just sample the lumen, we're going to miss the mucosa. And I say that because there's different influences on those two different microbiome populations. So the lumen population, that, that mainly, that population is mainly involved with digestion and metabolism, right? They're, they're, they're symbiotes. They're really helping us in that metabolic process as that little video just showed, right? The rumen micro the rumen microbiome is a classic example, but all the way throughout the GI tract, they're really being helpful. Um, and if I take feces, that's what I'm sampling. You'll see a lot of microbiome studies are looking at that, the, 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 the luminal uh, population. And that's affected by diet. That's affected by diet. What's interesting is the population that interacts with the immune system is, is, is growing along the mucosa. They're residential. They're not just transient. They don't, they don't just change by the diet. 
you actually find that the mum, the mum contributes a huge amount. We did a work, we did work on colostrum and found that colostrum doesn't just uh, contain immunoglobulins and immune cells, it contains uh, microbes. And the microbes that come from mum in the colostrum um, add to the, muc the mucosal layer, add to the ones that are stuck to the mucosa interacting with the immune system. So different factors affect one or both of these different microbe populations. The mum, the genetics, um, the health of the mucus layer, uh, diet and environment as well. So staying with this subject, um, you talked a little bit about some proactive things that we can do to support the, the microbiome. Are there things that we're doing that, that damages the microbiome? And I guess uh, antibiotics come to mind. Uh, do you have any thoughts uh, related to that? Yeah, Scott, that, that's a great question. And I, there's a lot of work going on in that area. We've done some work and we've done some work which have shown that and again, you can't look at all, all antibiotics in all different systems, right? We talked about this kind of dynamic system. So what an antimicrobial would do in one particular system might not be the same in others. We, we did some in some, uh, some pig work, and we found that depending on the antibiotic, um, the effect on the microbiome was um, it went away from normal but came back quite quickly. Some antibiotics, it went away and stayed away, stayed away from normal. So if you just took at the, the over... Uh, an overview of the whole microbiome population. Some antibiotics would, would kick it away and it, it, it was hard to, to come back. The other ones, you give it you give it, and it would come back pretty quickly. So I think it really depends a lot on the antibiotics, um, single dose, multiple doses. I still, I still think the jury is a little bit out on that. I think the, the, the general, right, the, the lay press is saying antibiotics are messing up the microbiome. That kind of makes sense to us, I think. But whether that's true for one one injection um, systemic or, or what kind of antibiotic, I think it's it's quite a complex problem. I think it's likely to, but but guess what's happening? Homeostatically, the immune system is going to respond to that, right? So if there's a change, it, you hopefully if it's if you have robust animals, they're going to respond and it not affect them health wise. So because uh, again, we've seen some of the benefits of uh, antibiotics. So you got to play with the system a little bit and see how that works out. I don't think there's a single answer to that. And I think that the jury is still out really uh, on that. It's a good question. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Joanna is asking, since the early life will dictate the animal's future performance, do you think that calves uh, have had a lot of neonatal disease should be dis uh, discarded from the herd? Um, yeah, I, that's that's a good that's a good question as well. Um, I think what we haven't covered today, which is really important, is what are the metrics for health and um, and for mucosal health? Uh, what are the metrics for pre-disease state? I mean, we'd love to know what's going on in a in a pre-disease state. I think COVID has given us a really good picture of that, right? So you have a viral infection, some just throw it off and they're fine. Uh, some get some mild disease and then recover, and some get severe disease and, and tragically loses to mortality. That really shows this kind of this individual phenotype. So I think it would be the same point with early life disease. I think there wouldn't be one rule for all different animals. You need to sort of have a really good sense of your particular herd and your particular animals within your herd and have a system for measuring that. Now, the best holistic measure is growth. Right. So if I had if I had a poorly growing animal, uh, if I had to say one measure, one measure that's holistic and tells me what's going on completely. If I have an animal that's had early life adversity and is not growing well, that's probably an animal that's not going to do well long term. If I had one that's got early life adversity and it's growing gangbusters, that one measure would tell me, hey, I'm going to keep that animal. So I, I would look at what are my metrics? What do I need to measure? What's my particular system? And so it, there wouldn't be a universal answer to that, too. But knowing your herd, knowing your animals is important. So great question. Yeah, I'm mindful of the time. We're right at the top of the hour. Um, can you spend a little bit more time with us or we need to wrap it yeah, up? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to stay a little while if, if others want me to, certainly. Very well. So Kirby is asking, with more and more individualized systems in commercial agriculture, do we know enough about metabolic uh, perturbation? Perturbations. Perturbations to feed, for, thank you, uh, feed pre-disease and diseased animals differently than healthy animals. Yeah, I, I think this area of immune metabolism is, is fantastic. I, I don't think we do know enough. I think um, 
um, because of things like diabetes, uh, because of, of obesity, uh, because of uh, interest in diet manipulation, because of disease like anorexia, I think we're, we are having, there's an explosion of understanding about uh, immune metabolism, which is why I think um, there was a, a, a recent Balkan seminar on it. I think, it was, have a look at that. It's really, it talks about this kind of the complexity of immune metabolism. But what we haven't done, we, we tend to be feeding for performance or feeding for growth or feeding for milk production, et cetera, which is great. Again, a great holistic measure. But I don't think we understand enough about, I think I mentioned different cells need different nutrients, different cells in different conditions, right? So um, uh, animals in, in, in hot situations, animals in Illinois, they, they're gonna need different, different conditions. So I think, I think there's a great opportunity to understand metabolism in the immune system um, and in this pre and in the pre-disease state not just in disease not just the deficiency of this causes this disease what 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 kicks an animal into this pre-disease state um, and so i think we can on the back of all this human under human medicine understanding of how particular nutrients affect different elements of the immune system i think that's a, a really ripe area for uh for development of uh of robust and resilient phenotypes in us in our animals not there yet very well uh the next question uh from gishford um can you please explain hbs in context of your presentation um yeah hemorrhagic bowel syndrome it's, that's a good question too right i mean HBS is a is a is a, a really interesting one. We did um, we did some microbiome work, um, and we had an outbreak in a feedlot actually of um, hemorrhagic diarrhea, and we looked at the microbiome of normal animals, and ones with uh, hemorrhagic um, hemorrhagic bowel, and guess what? The microbiome was totally different. The trouble is. We didn't know if the disease had caused the difference or the difference caused the disease. So they had totally different fecal, we just did feces, totally different fecal um, microbes. So we didn't find one bug, which a lot of people would say, oh, it's this bug. But actually, it's probably a dysbiosis. It's a combination of dysfunction of multiple bugs. And guess what? When the microbiome gets kicked out, it's going to fire up the inflammatory process in the intestine. So you've got this interaction between microbes, immune system, and epithelium. So bleeding of the epith uh, inflammation, bleeding, damage of the epithelium, and bleeding of the epithelium as well. So that triad is working in HBS, but we don't know which one started it uh, in some way. But you can imagine one could not the other. So maybe 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 it's maybe it's all different directions. Again, I don't think anybody knows, but the triad of epithelium, immune system, and microbiome explains it well. All right, thank you. Uh, Jay would like to know what biomarkers are used or potentially helpful in diagnosing a barrier function challenge, pre-disease state. Yeah, I, um, at the moment, Jay, I think um, probably respiratory wise, they're a little bit further ahead than we are as well. So, um, they are looking at some of the uh, the VOCs, the uh, volatile organic compounds, aren't they? I think that's what they're called. Um, and looking at kind of a breath analysis. And when you think about that, right, when you think about, so what they're doing, as, as you're analyzing, they're doing this in humans. Um, uh, University of Delaware, there's some good work, I think, that come, came out of that. This idea that what I'm breathing out doesn't just reflect the microbes, volatile organic compounds, VOC, yeah, volatile. Um, what I'm breathing out, that they could be bacterial products uh, or other microbial products. They could be epithelial, um, signs of epithelial metabolism, or they could be signs of inflammation. So they're looking at this composite breath that actually puts together information from all three of those different components. Um, we haven't, and I think the advantage of that is you're, you're sampling the mucosa, right? If, if you're sampling blood or something, then you're, you're relying on them being dumped into the bloodstream there's some marker that's going on so you're by definition you're missing a lot of the local inflammation uh, that, that could be to, or local epithelial damage so i don't think we have really good biomarkers whether they're fecal whether they're intestinal i don't think we we have them yet again i i think with uh, the mass um spec and and hplc and some of the things that's going on some of our protein chemistry 
um, working out really what 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 does an inflamed intestine look like? Uh, so there might be fecal markers that we can do uh, those in the future, but we're, again, we're not there yet. But we know what we know what we know what's being released. But where how can we measure them? I think so. Very well. Um, Paul is asking, can you suggest an ideal calf weaning strategy? And I'm assuming that's from a immunological perspective. Um, yeah, Paul, I would say, um, I'd say slow. I'd say gradual. Um, I think the importance of weaning, again, this is kind of the systems approach, right? We're, a lot of our students, they say, I want to, I want, give me a vaccination strategy or give me a worming strategy. And we say that's not what it's like. You need to go out and you need to get to know your clients, get to know what they're doing and what their needs are and what their expectations are and design the strategy around that particular person. So you and I would need to chat, right? To sort of come up, not me, you and your, your health professionals would kind of need to chat and sort of work out what that looked like. Um, what are your goals? Um, what, are your, what are your genetics? Uh, what are your limitations in your system in doing that? So I think, I think uh, transition, um, stress is spelled C-H-A-N-G-E, change, right? So the principles are, you don't want to have a sort of a loss, uh, a metabolic loss. So you don't want the animals to go into a negative energy balance or a negative protein balance, because they're developing their own immune system. So when you're weaning, you want to make sure that from wean, from milk to solids, you don't get a dip. And I don't mean just a dip in weight, Again, that's a good holistic measure. I'm talking about a dip in immune function as well. Maintain their immune system. That's a really um, uh, important phase. So, so slow changes, but maintaining the, 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 the quantity, quality of the nutrients is kind of really important. So change slowly um, and look at the response of the animal. So look at appetite, look at uh, fecal output, look at, uh, um, uh, there've been some really good measures can my, is my rumen working, right? So is the animal got a good appetite for grain? Um, have I seen him chewing the cud? So there's some good measures. How much grain is that individual taking in? So I would look at the individuals in some way, or an individual in your system, and look at the metrics and say, what can we achieve? But uh, I would say slow, slow and steady wins the race. Excellent. And we continue to get uh, many questions. So this has been a topic quite interesting to our audience. I, I'm going to uh, end with one final question, but would uh, remind uh, our audience that we're going to be having an upcoming podcast with Dr. Aldridge. Uh, also, send us uh, any additional questions that you may have at uh, anh.marketing.com, and we'll be sure to ask those questions during the podcast as well. Um, a final question. Of the four causes of stress you were talking to, which do you think is the most important to the growing ruminant? Yeah, I, I think um, it's got amazing in the clinic. If we get animals eating, um, it's incredible. I've had animals in a pro-inflammatory state. They, they've got a disease process going on. They get sent to clinic. They've had three or four different courses of antibiotics. They come in. Um, I take them off antibiotics and get them eating, or sometimes give them intravenous nutrients, uh, we, parenteral nutrition, we call it intravenous proteins or fats, and, and the animal will get better by supplying its metabolic needs. So I think um, the metabolism is kind of the foundation of a good immune response. Uh, I love the mucosa. I think, I think we've neglected mucosal immunity, immunity for systemic immunity, right? So I, I, I love the idea of the microbiome. I love the idea of epithelium and, and uh, the immune system kind of all working together. But if I had to say one thing, I think it's metabolism. So if, and, and you, you all know this, if you have an eating animal, right? A sick animal that's, that's not eating, a sick animal that's eating, they're both sick, but they're really different. Who's gonna get better? the one that continues to eat. So meeting those metabolic needs, understanding how the metabolism is affecting uh, immunity, particularly energy, particularly protein are really important. So I would say metabolism is key to uh, immune development. Well, thank you, Dr. Aldridge, I appreciate that. And, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at valchem.com and we'll forward them to you along with the unanswered questions from today's session. The next Real Science Lecture Series webinar for our monogastric listeners will be next week, January 12th. 
this controversial and uncomfortable topic will be of interest to our ruminant audience as well. Dr. Mark Post from Maastricht University will take us through the science behind lab-based cultured meat products. Though we do not support this practice, we feel it's important that we understand the process and science behind it so we can better educate producers and consumers going forward. On February 2nd, we will hear from Dr. Kevin Haver uh, Harvestein from Penn State University as he discusses feeding for milk fat production. Visit valchemanh.com slash real science for more details and to register. Valchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. The Real Science Exchange offers a casual discussion around the, a virtual pub table, getting to know top industry professionals and researchers like you've never known them before. Go behind the scenes and hear the conversations that take place over a few drinks with friends. Search for Real Science Exchange on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to follow us. There are currently six ep episodes available and they, we release them every first and third Tuesday of every month. You can listen to all the past episodes at valchemanh.com slash podcast. On behalf of Valchem and Dr. Aldridge, thank you for joining us today. Thank you.